Divide and Conquer, published at the Outpost of Freedom on August 16th, 2009. In war, in battlefield combat, one of the most important strategies, especially if the enemy has superior numbers, is to divide and conquer. Very briefly, it can be explained that if you have a force of 3,000 and the enemy has a force of 4,000, you will probably be defeated in combat. However, if you can cause him to divide his forces into two groups, each having about 2,000 men, you have gone from 25% less men against his entire force to a 50% advantage over one of the divided forces. Once the first unit is defeated, the second unit can be attacked with much greater odds than if an attack was made on the entire force at the outset. The same is true of the psychological warfare America is embroiled in today and the political warfare that has begun to divide the country and our own patriot community. Here are just some of the singular objectives that are commonly pursued today. Congress. Objective 1. The Congress is not reading the bills that they vote for. It has always astounded me that the Congress seems to find need for new legislation every year. Over 3,000 pieces of legislation are enacted every year. One would think that if what Congress did to solve problems worked, there would be less need for new laws rather than more. Perhaps understanding, as they have recently admitted, that they do not read the laws that they pass, we can understand why things are getting worse rather than better. The problem is that Congress, whether a senator or a representative, is elected and paid to do a job for his constituency. That job is to represent our interests regardless of recent flagrant disregard with respect to spending, answering questions about why they support something, and their general unwillingness to accept any responsibility for their actions, it would seem that enacting laws because someone told them that they were good law, and we don't have any idea who told them, is as far away from representation as one could possibly imagine. Objective 2. Balance the Budget. There has been for years an effort to force the federal government to balance the budget. Let's just suppose that they did. The budget would of necessity include debt service, payments on interest, and hopefully substantial amounts to reduce principal, along with the necessary expenses to conduct the business of government. Even if the operating expenses of the government were reduced to minimal, when added to the debt service, the amount required to continue the conducting of government business would be well beyond the means of the current sources of revenue. This would require imposing a tax that would be unbelievable and totally unacceptable to most Americans. The problem is that the debt is increasing at an alarming rate because Congress and the executive have determined that if they want it, they will buy it. Consider that the debt, right now, is in excess of $38,000 for every man, woman, and child in this country. Congress and the executive have dug a hole so immense that it is nearly impossible to get out of it, and they are taxing, without representation, those yet unborn. Objective 3. Kick them all out. So, who will fill their vacancy? Another programmed member of their political party, or the programmed member of the other political party? In the event that you do manage to get a third-party candidate into office, it will, more likely, be a lowly office that offers no threat to the establishment power scheme. Further, if against all odds, 
your third party candidate ascends to a higher and more influential position, you can rest assured that he will either succumb to the way that it's done by trading votes to get some of his items passed or being but one or two who vote against bad legislation because they believe it to be bad legislation. The problem is that the legislative system in this country at federal, state, county, and city levels has, with few exceptions, become corrupted and the office is sought for personal gain and influence, not to represent the people. In reviewing these issues and realizing what the outcome of each will provide as a result, we can see that we are facing a myriad of tasks, none or few of which will result in more than a very singular solution to a very singular problem. If, after years of effort, a battle, which has been waged, is won, leaving no residual to encumber us into a continuation of that battle, we can then choose another battle to pursue. However, who is to believe that if a battle is won finally and decidedly, that another objective will not appear to take its place? The division of our forces is inherent in the struggle as we are pursuing it. Each, due to his personal ideology, has chosen one or another of the objectives and is willing to give 100%, not realizing the futility of even success in that battle once the battle is completed. Is there an alternative course that can achieve all of the objectives? If we were in a battlefield where an effort has been made to divide the forces, giving advantage to the enemy, we would, if our objective was to win and we had superior forces, refuse to divide our force. The enemy would have anticipated being successful in creating the division, as they most certainly believed to be the case, and would not anticipate an all-out attack on their main base, leaving them divided simply by believing that we were divided. In this psychological or political war that we are engaged in, what strategy would overcome the division that has given such an advantage to the enemy? Could it be to concentrate our forces on a single issue? Most assuredly, it would be unsuccessful, since, even though that battle may be won, it would only lead us to the next battle, and the next, and eventually, to defeat. Would we rather pay lip service to George Washington, or would we rather do that which is necessary to achieve the removal of a despotic government? He was willing to do what was necessary to expel those who resisted allowing freedom and liberty to prevail in the land. He supported those peaceful efforts when there was hope for them to succeed. When that hope was gone, though, he chose the only course that remained. When peaceful methods had convinced the Founding Fathers that they would be of no avail, the efforts were stepped up to force the hand of the despotic government. Surrender was not in their vocabulary. The desire of the despots to retain control was the force that was necessary to compel the colonists to risk all when all else had failed. We have tried petitions. We have tried demonstration. We have been ignored by those in power for every effort we have exerted. Perhaps now is the time to extend our efforts into physical effort. Create displeasure and discomfort for those in power and those who support them. In addition, we must be sincere and methodical, for if we fail in this effort, there remain but two choices, victory by force of arms, or 
defeat by failure to be willing to fully commit to the cause.